fun fact and another thing that needs to be common knowledge, language defines ideas. <laughs> if we don't have a word for something, it doesn't exist. And English is unique in that it has the most words. It's a mosaic language. It just takes on words and we make up words all the time. A dictionary is just the current implicit common consensus on words and their meaning. And connotation is then also a matter of culture and context and, and society. And in an age of digital saturation, context becomes individual. A word is just a socially accepted sound that has a meaning. It's just a sign and a signifier. As an example, I want to share the word sonder with you. Sonder is the realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, populated with their own ambitions, friends, routines, worries, and inherited craziness, an epic story that continues invisibly around you like an anthill sprawling deep underground, with elaborate passageways to thousands of other lives that you'll never know existed, in which you might appear only once as an extra sipping coffee in the background, or as a blur of traffic passing on the highway, or as a lighted window at dusk. And what's even more ironic is when I went to go do etymological research on this word, I found out that it's a meme word, but now it just is a word because it has enough traction and that makes it a word. That's how words work. Profound respect for the experience of other humans is the trick to a compassionate society. If we reward empathy and kindness more than we reward power and control on both a social and an individual level, we can alter the course of social cultural development. Understanding that each and every one of us is having complex and multidimensional experience also allows us to clearly divide the world into what we can and cannot control and develop a compassionate sovereignty over our lives and allow others to do the same. Okay, so I have to tell a story um, as a biologist. There was baboons or macaques or something, uh, primates. They were primates with tribes. I think they were baboons. And there was some sort of bacterial thing that was going around and it killed all the adult males in a troop. And in a single generation, all the men were wiped out. And so all the little, little children were raised by only females. And the females in this particular, there was huge sexual dimorphism where there was different behaviors taken on by the males and the females. So there was a whole generation of little boy baboons that were raised exclusively by females. And so when they became adults, other males came and tried to come into the troop to mate with the females. It didn't work, they were checked because everybody in that troop was like, no, we don't do the aggressive behavior here. In a single generation, they just got rid of the people practicing it and they allowed the communal adults to run things and there was a massive change. And that's the trick. In order for those other b male baboons to enter the troop, they had to follow the rules of the troop. If we simply began rejecting the things we didn't want in the world, we would just condition people. If they wanna see us, they have to see us at our boundaries. Once we've stuck to our boundaries and held our boundaries for a meaningful period of time, the people that we interact with are forced to face the reality. These are the rules, these are the limitations, these are the conditions under which you'll see me. The most challenging aspect in healing from like abusive relationships, abusive childhoods, is acknowledging the way in which those dynamics fit both people's dysfunction. As an example, I could easily say that my relationship with my ex fell apart because he was older and he was abusive. But the truth is that I participated in the fights and I enabled the dysfunction. I could say that the way that he treated me and the way that he was in the relationship justified the way that I treated him, but I could have just left him. I could have just been like, oh, this is dysfunctional and just not stuck around. At the end of the day, I am the only one that I can control. When we take responsibility for ourselves, we then take control of our lives. On a broader scale, when we approach society as something for us to participate in, we can create meaningful change. It, when we consciously realize that we have a bias based on our own individual experience, it's much, much easier to be like, oh, well, this is what you're doing, but this is what I feel you're doing. It's much easier to have that distinction when you know what your triggers and biases and whatever, when you know your head.